Hello. The episode you're about to listen to is part of a multi-part series introducing an overview of Japanese history. This is a repeat of one of the original projects the History of Japan podcast was built on, and is intended to serve as an update and supplement to these original works. After 10 years, my hope is to return to this approach and to do it a little bit better given the skills that I have improved in the intervening years. If you haven't been doing so already, you should listen to these episodes sequentially, starting with episode 501. Without any further ado, enjoy the episode. Welcome to the History of Japan podcast, episode 518, The Low Conquers the High, Part 1. When we talk about the Sengoku Jidai, the era of warring states, which came after Ashikaga rule fell apart in the 1460s and 1470s, it is, from what I can tell, basically mandatory to take a moment and introduce the phrase Gekokujo. Seriously, I don't think I've ever read anything on this period that didn't have at least some paragraph describing what this means. And admittedly, there's a good reason for that. The three characters in that phrase literally mean the low conquers the high, and from a certain perspective, it's a pretty apt description of what happened in Japan during this period. The next two weeks are going to be all Gekokujo all the time. You see, the Sengoku period is obviously an age of great turbulence. There is no way I could cover all the ins and outs of the fights and alliances and betrayals and all that good stuff in any meaningful way. So instead, I'm going to use this notion of Gekokujo as, to use some fancy historian phrasing, a lens through which to view the period, a way of making sense of the key ideas of the time, of finding patterns in a chaotic age. This week, we're going to focus on two of the most powerful samurai clans going into the Sengoku period, which were both brought low by the chaos of war and reduced to bit players in the future of politics. Next week, we're going to look at the other side of things, two warrior families that began this period in obscurity, but which rose to substantial power and prominence over the course of the Sengoku era. The idea being to give you some sense of the turbulence of the period without overwhelming you by trying to cover literally all of it, because that would be like a 20-episode series in its own right. So we're going to start with two names that are already familiar to you, actually, the Yamana and Hosokawa. These are, of course, the two rival families which took up the excuse provided by the succession crisis of the 1460s, to fight each other for control of Kyoto and the Shogun. In other words, the two parties most responsible, arguably, for the Onin War. But what happened to them afterwards? We'll start with the Yamana, a family very much of what you might call the samurai aristocracy. You see, they could trace their lineage back to the line of the Sewa Minamoto, the warriors descended from the Emperor Sewa, who counted Minamoto no Yoritomo, the founder of the Kamakura Bakufu, the first warrior government, among their number. Specifically, the Yamana were descended from one Minamoto no Yoshishige, a distant cousin and rough contemporary of Yoritomo's. The Yamana were descended from Yoshishige's illegitimate child Yoshinori, who took the surname Yamana to distinguish himself from his father's legitimate kids, a name he took from his place of residence, what's now Yamanamachi in Gunma Prefecture. His father's legitimate children, meanwhile, started using a different surname, Nita, derived from their own place of residence, also in modern Gunma Prefecture. Both the Yamana and the Nita did very well for themselves under first Yoritomo and his descendants, and then the Hojo. Both were counted among the Shogun's Gokenin, or personal retainers, and considered very reliable supporters of the Kamakura shogunate given their Minamoto ancestry. However, their fortunes took starkly different turns in the 1330s when the Kamakura government fell apart. If the name Nita sounds familiar, it's because we've actually encountered it before. Nita Yoshisada was one of the prominent commanders on the southern court anti-Ashkaga side 
at least until his death in 1338. The Amana clan leadership was, by contrast, uh, more, let's be nice and call it enterprising in their allegiance. And what I mean by that, of course, is they were completely mercenary about who they chose to support. The Amana started off on Team Southern Court, but flipped sides repeatedly over the course of the conflict, based on whoever was winning or making them a better offer. Which is not going to make you a lot of friends, certainly, but provided you time things right, it will result in a lot of people throwing a lot of money and land at you to get you to flip their way. By the 1390s, the Yamana were one of the wealthiest families in Japan. The head of the Yamana clan, Yamana Uji Kyo, held the title of Shugo military governor over 11 different provinces. He was jokingly nicknamed Rokubun no Ichidono, roughly Lord One-Sixth, since his family holdings were now slightly over one-sixth of the traditional 60 provinces of Japan. Now, despite being one of the most powerful people in the country, Yamana Uji Kyo's time as leader of the Yamana clan was not what you would call smooth sailing. The shogun in the 1390s was Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, probably in hindsight the single best leader of the Ashikaga years, and a clear-minded pragmatist who was not blind to the dangers presented by such a powerful vassal. In fact, Yoshimitsu actually tried to rein the Yamana in in 1389 by ordering Uji Kyo, who had not originally been the family head, to attack the then head of the Yamana family, his own nephew, hoping clearly to trigger a civil war within the Yamana clan and weaken it. That didn't work as he hoped, though. Uji Kyo was far too talented and won far too decisively and quickly for that hope to play out. So instead, Yoshimitsu began to clamp down more openly on Uji Kyo, eventually leading to an outright Yamana clan rebellion in 1392. With massive forces to call on, Uji Kyo's armies made it as far as the outskirts of Kyoto, but he was eventually defeated and Uji Kyo was killed in the fighting. In the aftermath, the Yamana were stripped of a great many of their holdings, but it didn't keep them down for very long. Two generations down the road, another ambitious leader would take the reins of power for the clan and lead it back to greatness. This was Yamana Solzen, born in 1404 and succeeding his family head in 1433 after his father retired from politics due to ill health. Solzen would first emerge on the national stage in 1441 as he took advantage of an opportunity presented to him. That opportunity was the assassination of Ashikaga Yoshinori, a tyrannical shogun notable for his paranoia and fondness for executing people, which eventually caught up with him when another major family head, Akamatsu Mitsuke, became convinced he was next on Yoshinori's hit list and bumped the shogun off first. Yamana Sozen seized the opportunity, marshalling his army as soon as he got word of what had happened to hunt down and kill Akamatsu in order to show his loyalty to the house of Ashikaga conveniently also rebuilding his clan's fortunes by conquering all the Akamatsu lands in the process. As a result, Yamana Sozen emerged as one of the most influential men in the inner circle of shogunal politics, and at a good time to boot, because after Yoshinori's death, the next two shoguns, Yoshikatsu and Yoshimasa, were both children, easily influenced by the adults around them. Ashikaga Yoshimasa's reign as shogun was of course not without its problems, chiefly the succession dispute we discussed last episode, and Yamana Solzen would end up being one of the main instigators who turned that dispute into an all-out war. For a quick reminder, since it's been a week, Ashikaga Yoshimasa hated being shogun and wanted to retire ASAP, but he was in such a rush to do this, he kinda screwed things up. He promised the job to his brother Yoshimi, but then had a son, or, alternatively, his wife slept with another man to get pregnant, and began to flip-flop on who to hand things off to. One of Yamana Solzen's main rivals, who we'll talk about in a second, was very close to that brother Yoshimi, so Solzen naturally decided to back the claim of the newborn son, Ashikaga Yoshihisa. Very clearly, the plan was to put a boy indebted to him into the job of Shogun and use that boy as a vehicle for his own influence to run the country from behind the scenes. And so Yamana Solzen would come to basically run the pro-Yoshihisa side of the emerging Onin War, 
and I guess technically he did win in that Yoshihisa did end up becoming a shogun, but also not really. The Onin War itself was of course inconclusive, neither side of the succession dispute was able to gain a clear advantage one way or the other. Indeed, the war ended mostly because Yamana Sozen and his opposite number in the opposing camp both died in 1473, and their successors decided that continuing the fighting just wasn't worth it. Still, the Yamana were well set up as the country broke down into civil war. Their preferred candidate was on the throne of an albeit substantially weakened Ashkaga shogunate, and they were still one of the wealthiest families in the country. Yamana Solzen was, at the time of his death, the shugo of six different provinces, Yamashiro, Tanba, Bingo, Aki, Iga, and Harima provinces specifically. So hey, they're naturally going to be pretty successful in an age of war where that much land and the wealth from that land would immediately vault you to the top of the contenders list, right? Well, no. In point of fact, the Amana clan would collapse dramatically over the course of the Sengoku Civil Wars. They weren't wiped out altogether like some of their fellow big families from the Ashkaga years, but they also very much came out on the losing end. But how, I hear you wondering, could anyone coming in with such a massive advantage lose? Well, in part, this comes down to a question of leadership. Yamana Solzen's successor, Yamana Masatoyo, did not have a particularly stellar aptitude for politics, and much preferred spending time in the cultural center of Kyoto to actually going out into the provinces to govern his lands. Fun fact, I saw one claim that Yamana Masatoyo was so into the tea ceremony that the retired shogun Yoshimasa, the same guy whose indecision triggered the succession crisis behind the Onin War, gave Masatoyo a tea set. But not just any tea set, the Tsukumonasu, a famous Chinese-made tea set from the 1100s that had belonged to Ashkaga Yoshimitsu, the most famous of the Ashkaga shoguns. That said, not every source tracing that tea set's history, and it's still around, it was purchased by a Mitsubishi heir and is now in a museum in Tokyo, mentions Yamana Masatoyo as an owner, so I'm not 100% sure this is true. Regardless, Masatoyo clearly preferred the finer things in life to the drudgery of government, and in an age of civil war, you couldn't really get away with that sort of thing. And here we have to take a moment to talk about an important institution of the late Ashkaga years and the age of civil war, the Kokujin. That term roughly means something like people of the provinces, but that doesn't fully capture its meaning. I've seen it translated as everything from armed proprietors to simply provincial warriors. I don't think there's a clean or easy way to render it into English, to be frank. Broadly, Kokujin represented what you might call the middle ranks of samurai society. Not as influential as the major warrior families who spent time in Kyoto and got appointments as Shugo, but within their specific home provinces, Kokujin families were influential. The term has roots going back to early medieval Japan in the time of the Minamoto shoguns. Originally, it referred either to a local overlord of a province, someone who ruled an area they were from, in other words, or to a jito, samurai supervisors of a shoen estate, who was supervising the area he was from. These kokujin were often also gokenin, direct vassals of the shogun himself, serving as a check, in essence, against the power of their shugo military governors. However, during the Ashkaga years, the independent power of the Kokujin in this time began to fade. There are a few different reasons why. Most broadly, the compromises Ashkaga Takauji and his successors made to empower the big Shugo families and convince them to join the Ashkaga cause also made it easier for the Shugo to control the Kokujin. Many Shugo relied on their new income from Takauji's decrees, allowing the Shugo to collect far more in taxes than had previously been the case, to simply buy off local Kokujin, essentially giving them a cut in exchange for that Kokujin swearing obedience to the Shugo family. However, attempts to control them didn't always work. For example, in 1387, the Shiba family, Shugo of Shinano province in the center of Japan, found that the Kokujin of the area had organized themselves into a defensive league to physically prevent the Shiba or their followers from entering the province. 
Apparently, said local Kokujin were convinced that the Shiba planned to disregard their traditional independence. Not without good reason, very much likely the Shiba would have done that. This Kokujin League was enormously successful, fighting off a Shiba attempt to forcibly seize the province in 1387 and another one in 1399. In 1402, the shogun Ashikaga Yoshimitsu stepped in and stopped the fighting by just declaring Shinano a part of his personal land holdings and removing any need for a Shugo, essentially giving in and letting the Kokujin just continue on as before. Kokujin challenges to Shugo authority only grew as the central power of the Ashkaga Bakfu broke down. In some cases, specific lords were able to bring Kokujin around either by means of bribery or pure military force, but in others, the Kokujin were able to drive off their Shugo, particularly once it became clear there was no more central authority capable of forcing a disliked Shugo onto a province. This is exactly what happened to the Yamana clan, which controlled six provinces, but six provinces that are scattered all across the central third of Honshu, making it very challenging to manage all of that land, especially with any sort of personal touch. Over the subsequent decades, the Yamana lost more and more of their traditional lands to rebellions by their Kokujin, as former followers of the clan declared themselves independent of the Shugo family. By the 1500s, the Yamana had lost control of all but two of their provinces out of the original six, Tajima and Tanba provinces to the west of Kyoto itself. To make matters worse, after Yamana Masatoyo's death, sometime between 1499 and 1502, the precise date being unclear, the Yamana clan itself began to fracture into rival lines. You see, the reason why the Yamana were able to hang on to those two provinces was that the family was physically present there and able to manage the lands directly by way of some of the sons of Masatoyo. However, those two branches, led by those two sons, in Tajima and Tanba, began to grow apart over time until they were functionally different wings of the same family, each one believing that it was the leading branch, so to speak, of the family tree, and once again, I bet you can guess where this is going. The result was, of course, a civil war within the Yamana family, which the Tajima branch did eventually manage to win, led by its daimyo, a term we're going to talk more about in a second, Yamana Suketoyo. Suketoyo's victory would prove short-lived, though, because he would end up falling afoul of the first of Japan's unifiers a few decades later, Oda Nobunaga, and would die in battle in 1580. Another branch of the Yamana did manage to survive, chiefly because they did a better job picking winners to follow in the future. The Yamana clan would endure all the way to the abolition of feudalism in Japan, but it was never again anything other than a bit player in politics. Still, I imagine the later leaders of the Yamana clan could take some comfort in the fact that they were not alone in that fate. Their rivals in the Hosokawa clan suffered more or less the same. The Hosokawa clan, of course, led the fighting on the other side of the Onin War, which ripped the Muromachi Bakfu apart, and in many ways the story of their origin is very similar to that of the Amana. Indeed, their story is remarkably similar right down to their origins. Like the Yamana, the Hosokawa could trace their descent back to the line of Seiwa Minamoto warriors, whose ancestry in turn went back to the imperial family. The Hosokawa specifically branched off a little bit later. They were actually an offshoot of the Ashikaga, who, remember, were their own branch of the Minamoto line, who took a different surname to distinguish themselves from the main line. Much like the Ashikaga, the Hosokawa took their name from a landholding, in this case their place of residence, Hosokawa Village in what was then Nukata County, Mikawa Province, today a part of Okazaki City in Aichi Prefecture. Given their familial relationship with the Ashikaga clan, they naturally came down on the side of Ashikaga Takauji during his rebellion against the Emperor Godaigo. Of course, they were not altruistic about it, the family relationship certainly helped, but so too, one imagines, did the substantial promises Takeuji and his successors made to the Hosokawa about the amount of land and treasure they would be given. And those promises were kept. By the end of the war between the northern and southern courts in the 1390s, the Hosokawa family were Shugo of eight different provinces. 
And I can't really say they were overpaid, so to speak. They certainly did contribute a great deal to the war effort on the Ashkaga side. In particular, the family head in the later decades of the war, Hosokawa Yoriyuki, is one of the most titanic figures on the Ashkaga side of things. He took the reins of the clan in 1352 at the age of 23 after his father died in the fighting, and led an army to avenge his father's death and kill several members of the Hosokawa family who had defected to the other side. Along the way, he also defeated the Yamana clan, actually, during one of their flip-flops over to the southern court, setting up the rivalry, so to speak. Hosokawa Yoriyuki would go on to be so successful that he'd be named Kyoto Kanrei, essentially second-in-command of the Muromachi Bakufu after Ashikaga Takauji himself, and after Takauji's death, he continued to serve both the Shogun's son and his grandson. A full accounting of his impressive deeds is beyond us here, but the highlight reel would have to include leading the conquest of the Chugoku region, the westernmost part of the main island of Honshu, as well as negotiating the defection of several prominent southern court followers to the Ashikaga side, most prominently the grandson of the great Kusunoki Masashige, and finally late in his life being the lead negotiator who cut the surrender agreement with the southern court to end the fighting. It was, pretty much however you slice it, a spectacular career. Hosokawa Yoriyuki would die in 1392, the same year the southern court itself surrendered. His successors would oversee a family that had, thanks to his efforts, become one of the most influential players in the whole country. They would retain that position for half a century before the rising power of the Yamana clan and Yamana Sozen began to challenge the Hosokawa led by Hosokawa Katsumoto. Initially, mind you, the relationship between these two men was not actually bad. Katsumoto and Yamana Sozen started off as political allies working together against other clans at court, and the two actually entered into a marriage alliance at one point. Sozen was married to Katsumoto's daughter. However, as Yamana influence at court grew, Katsumoto began to view them as a greater threat, and the alliance began to break apart. And that brings us to the Onin War, this time on the other side, with Hosokawa Katsumoto deciding to back Ashikaga Yoshimasa's brother, Ashikaga Yoshimi. Again, we know how this war ends, I'm not going to belabor it much. Hosokawa Katsumoto, like Yamana Sozen, died in 1473, and the war he helped start ended inconclusively. Yet, like the Yamana, the Hosokawa were still in a strong position at the start of the Age of Civil War but they too would find themselves crashing back to Earth before too long. Once again, the issue was partially one of leadership. Katsumoto's successor was his son, Hosokawa Masamoto, a brilliant and ruthless commander who was unafraid to take bold steps to expand his power. And I do mean bold. In 1493, Masamoto led an army to Kyoto claiming to support the sitting shogun in his aim of rebuilding Ashikaga control of more of the country, only to launch a coup once he got there, removing that shogun and replacing him with a younger and more pliable relative, and going on to rule the city of Kyoto and its surroundings, the wealthiest part of the country, from behind the scenes. Masamoto's leadership carried the Hosokawa to a leading position, but he made a fateful mistake. He didn't have any children. In fairness, he was pretty young. His takeover of Kyoto in 1493 happened when he was only 27, so probably not thinking too deeply about his own mortality or questions of succession. Why Masamoto never had kids is a matter of some dispute. There are different theories out there, with the most commonly cited one being that he was gay and thus not terribly interested in the traditional method by which one acquires a child, but he was also a very devoted follower of the religious mystic syncretic tradition known as Shugendo, which is way more complicated than anything we can get into here. Basically, it's Taoism and Shinto with a little bit of Buddhism thrown into a blender. But the important thing is it has strong taboos around sex. Regardless of why he didn't have biological kids, Hosokawa Masamoto did have a plan for the succession. Three of them, actually, because he adopted three different sons from three different families, known to history respectively as Hosokawa Sumimoto, Hosokawa Sumiyuki, and Hosokawa Takakuni. But the thing is, three heirs, in a sense, creates as many problems as it fixes, 
Because in the end, you can only pick one of them, and the other two are gonna be, to put it mildly, a bit put out about that. And so, of course, it went with the Hosokawa. Eventually, Hosokawa Masamoto settled on Sumimoto as his preferred heir, largely, one imagines, because Sumimoto was a distant relative of his from another branch of the Hosokawa family. But this did not make Hosokawa Sumiyuki, adopted from the aristocratic Kyoto family known as the Kujo, very happy, particularly because, prior to Sumimoto's adoption, Sumiyuki had already been promised he would be heir. And so Sumiyuki began to conspire to take what he saw as his birthright, and in 1507, formed a conspiracy with three of his adoptive father's bodyguards. On the 11th day of the 8th lunar month of 1507, as Hosokawa Masamoto was getting ready to take a bath, he was jumped by those bodyguards and stabbed to death. He was 42 years old. After Masamoto's death, things went very badly for the Hosokawa in very short order. Sumiyuki, of course, declared himself the new head of the family with the backing of some Hosokawa vassals, as well as the Ashikaga Shogun, who at this point was basically a Hosokawa puppet. Sumiyuki was not, however, successful in chasing down the brother whose job he had stolen. Sumimoto successfully escaped from Kyoto for Omi province with the help of other Hosokawa retainers who were still loyal to him. Those retainers then began to assemble an army, and within a month, Hosokawa was fighting Hosokawa in a good old-fashioned clan civil war. Sumimoto's side did win out in pretty short order, and the usurper and patricide Sumiyuki would commit suicide before the year was out, as many who had supported his coup began to abandon him. But this was not the end of the Hosokawa family troubles, because waiting for them in the wings was another longtime rival, the Ouchi clan of the Chugoku region of western Honshu. We're going to talk more about the Ouchi next week, actually, so we're going to not spend too much time on them here, but simply put, they were another major Shugo family of the Ashikaga years, who were now weathering the transition over to the age of civil war. And they had a big advantage on their side in 1507. Remember how, in 1493, Hosokawa Masamoto had come to power by leading a coup against the sitting Shogun? and replacing him with a more pliable, younger relative? Well, the Shogun Masamoto had replaced, Ashikaga Yoshitane, did not die in that coup. He was still kicking around, and he'd spent the intervening years looking for someone, anyone, who would help him retake what was rightfully his, and settled on the Ouchi as his preferred candidates for doing that. And so, as this family civil war was winding down, Word came to Kyoto that the Ouchi had smelled blood in the water, marshaled an army, and were now marching towards the imperial capital to restore the true shogun to power and punish the Hosokawa usurpers. Hosokawa Sumimoto had to flee Kyoto once again to escape. But wait, wasn't there a third son floating around too? Why, yes, there was, and that son, Hosokawa Takakuni, decided to stay in Kyoto. And when the Ouchi and Ashikaga Yoshitane got there, he promptly asked that they make him the new head of the Hosokawa clan, since his treasonous brother was clearly not loyal to the true shogun. And so we have yet another Hosokawa family civil war, with the clan divided between pro Takakuni vassals who fought alongside the Ouchi and the shogun Ashikaga Yoshitane, and pro Sumimoto vassals who rallied to attempt to retake Kyoto alongside those still loyal to the Hosokawa puppet shogun. From here, things spiraled pretty predictably for the Hosokawa clan. Takakuni was ultimately victorious in his contest with his brother, and by the way, for those playing along at home, this all means that in the span of one year, the headship of the Hosokawa clan turned over four times, from Masamoto to Sumiyuki to Sumimoto to Takakuni. However, their civil war took until 1520 to fully resolve, so 13 years of fighting, and the ultimately victorious Takakuni would himself be deposed in a coup in 1525, led by several of his own retainers, as Takakuni had become increasingly paranoid about conspiracies against his leadership and begun to mistreat them. The coup plotters ended up replacing Takakuni, who spent the rest of his life exiled from Kyoto, with Sumimoto's son, Hosokawa Harumoto, who would then spend the rest of his life 
locked in a contest with Takakuni and his son, fighting for control of Kyoto and leadership of the Hosokawa clan, and ultimately everyone ended up losing because the neighboring Miyoshi clan took advantage of these deep divisions in the Hosokawa house and the weaknesses from decades of internal conflict to sweep in and drive the Hosokawa from Kyoto permanently. Only a single small branch of the Hosokawa would survive in Tanba province along the Japan Sea coast, led by Hosokawa Yusai, who was actually not a Hosokawa by birth, but was the adopted biological child of one of the Ashkaga shoguns. Yusai is more notable for his poetry and dedication to the arts than his interest in politics, and it was probably that focus, plus a talent for picking winners during the last decades of civil war, that allowed his branch of the family to survive. However, while they did survive, which was no small accomplishment given all this, they were a decidedly minor family in a remote part of the country, and much like the Yamana, would remain as such all the way to the end of feudalism in Japan in the mid-1800s. So, what can we learn about the Age of Civil War from the dramatic fall from grace of both the Yamana and Hosokawa clans? I think there are a few different important lessons about the period to be found here. First, and probably most obviously, both the Hosokawa and Yamana were brought low by what we might call civil wars within the families. Those sorts of divisions are certainly not new, they've cropped up in many of the conflicts we've talked about over the last 18 episodes. But in an age where there was no overarching authority to step in and try and end the conflicts, well, they could get very deadly for anyone caught up in them. And as we'll see next week, more successful clans were also generally better at managing succession to avoid these kinds of issues, usually by designating a clear heir early on and setting the stage for a planned handoff of power to them. Second, strength at the start of the Age of Warring States did not guarantee victory or even survival. Both the Hosokawa and Yamana clans were reliant for their power on the legitimacy given to them by virtue of their Shugo titles, granted to them by the Muromachi Bakufu and the Ashkaga Shoguns. However, after the Onin War, the practical authority of the Ashkaga Shoguns shrank away into nothing outside of their home base in Kyoto. The Shugo, out in the provinces, became, practically speaking, independent operators who, at best, paid homage on paper to their nominal overlords. Yet this was not quite the boon many Shugo may have thought it was, as the Yamana and Hosokawa discovered. Some lost power over their provinces in wars with neighbors. Others, particularly the Yamana, spent so long in Kyoto they lost touch with their own vassals in the provinces, and realized belatedly the authority of the shoguns was the only thing keeping them in power. Without it, they were overthrown by their own deputies or local kokujin. This moment thus marks an important transition for us in terms of both history and terminology. The Hosokawa and Yamana both failed because they were not successful in transitioning away from the role of Shugo, a role that really only mattered so long as the Ashkaga shoguns could enforce it, and towards Sengoku Daimyo, Territorial Lords of the Warring States era. Successful Sengoku Daimyo families, we'll look at a few examples next week, were generally more adept at managing the administration of their provinces and focused on keeping their warrior populations happy and loyal to their cause, or at least comparatively easy to control, while expanding against weakened neighbors and relying on clever politics, not raw military strength. It was overwhelmingly the families that took this approach that ended the Age of Civil War in control of much of the country. Again, we'll look at some examples next week, but for now, that's all for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This show is a part of the Facing Backward podcast network. You can find out more about this show and our other shows at facingbackward.com, and you can support the network at patreon.com slash facingbackward. Special thanks to those who have given at our shout-out tier. Yan Leonard, Stephen Elkins, Martin Oliveira, Clark Canning, Ian Kellett, Matt Haynes, Jackie Frostocker, Monkey Sack, Alayla McCulloch, Karen Murphy, Peter Wales, Robert Prine, William Arno, Jonas Brandis, Nicholas Kroll, Jerry Spinrad, Jared Stevens, Jeffrey Dwork, Stefan Hrushka, Joshua Kane, Robbie and Kat, Jacob Key, Aaron Finkbeiner, an anonymous Anna's Hummingbird, Mark Sai, Gil, Leslie Ikuta, Trash Taste Enjoyer, John Christopher, Harrison Reese, Inoue Enrio's Ghostbusters, NihongoKaizen.com, 
Shimao Toshio's History of Yapanesia podcast, A House Is a Perfectly Cromulent Mascot, The Fish I Catch Are Road Scholars Compared to Samuel Alito, Schmuck, and Everything Changed When the Fire Nation Attacked. Also, special thanks this week to new patrons Tez, Daniel, and Paul for their donations to the History of Japan Patreon. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next week for a look at the other side of the coin.